Welcome back to Accounting Information Systems and Internal Controls. Today's topic is particularly interesting because we have gone through a journey that takes us from understanding data elements that are relevant and critical for accountants to know and to be able to master. Uh, and we've actually gained experience on applications that are going to be used every day in your accounting profession as you think of the graduation date i'm hoping that by that time you'll be able to accumulate all of this knowledge so that you can be a lot more prepared to serve your profession uh in a way that is expected from 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 you in the 21st century in this digital era so i'm very pleased uh, uh with our trajectory we've gone through understanding Excel at a deeper level, understanding cloud-based applications uh, that represent Excel and databases. We are able to locate different information, different tables based on the different business cycles that exist. We are also able to visualize data and apply data analytics principles so that we can make better decisions using our tools that we have, such as Tableau. We are able to navigate through QuickBooks, et cetera, uh, and understand how to do journal entries and, 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 and so forth. So, but now I would like us to focus on the internal controls that we will be implementing to make sure that we mitigate the risk of uh, losing our digital assets or having any other type of loss in our business. So in order for us uh, to continue with this topic, I'd like to start by giving you a little bit of a background of why is it that we need to have controls. And let's start by talking about ethical principles. All right, so what are ethical principles? Those are personal attitudes on issues of right and wrong, as simple as that. They are normally derived from societal traditions or from cultural values that are learned as we grow up and as we are um, receiving guidance and mentoring from, from our elders, from our society institutions, from our professors, etc. Or they can be formed through a personal life experience. And since everybody has different life experiences and we come from different places, often with different parents and so forth, when we all get together in one organization, such as a company, um, everybody will have different cultural backgrounds. And because of that, it is very likely that we'll have different values. All of these are a reflection of some kind of failure in our, in our value system. So it is imperative that we, as professors, point, direct you back to understanding that you guys, as accountants, will be the principal moral compass of any type of organization. And as such, you guys need to make sure that you have that ethical backbone very well cemented, right? Very, very well cemented. So we hear a bunch of justifications, right? Unethical conduct happens because people are unconsciously fooling themselves, right? We, on and on and on, we tend to justify as a society, well, everybody does it, so it's okay. It is not okay. And we need to be the individuals out there that set up a new uh, a new set of rules. And this is what this chapter is all about. How do we become more effective at practicing our ethical um, principles? And with that being said, we're going to go into our first learning objective, which is to explain essential control concepts and why the code of ethics and internal controls are so important. Right? So we discussed that Sometimes it is very difficult for everybody to be on the same page in terms of what is right and wrong. So a code of ethics is a matter in which a firm can promulgate how everybody's expected to behave. It is then a formal expectation of what is considered to be ethical within an organization to promote ethical behavior. As simple as that. And if we did not have that type of code of ethics, what would happen? Well, here's the why of having a code of ethics. Number one, as we explained before, employees with different cultural backgrounds are likely to have different values. And as such, we as corporations or as business people need to make sure that we educate everybody on what is expected out of them. And that 
tone that we set has to be set all the way from the top and it should be promulgated across the organization by doing so by informing everybody this is what's expected and everybody adheres to that everybody follows those rules then we are creating an internal control on itself as opposed to not knowing what is expected of me so i may not know that it's not okay to eat all the cookies that are left at the end of the day but if i have a code of ethics that actually addresses that and everybody follows that then that can serve as an internal control because most likely people will not be willing to break a rule it is for this reason that many organizations have developed their own uh, professional code of ethics the aicpa isaka iia and ima are, have all created uh, their own code of ethics to assist professionals in selecting among decisions that are not clearly right or wrong. So when in question, it's always great to go back to what the AICPA has published for their certified public accountants to follow in order to remain in good standing of the organization. Other organizations have come up with their own code of ethics once again to make sure that you as accounting professionals are implementing all these principles in your place of work. What motivated this creation of different ethic codes by different organizations? Well, if we look back to the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, we had just gone through the major failure of a company that was in everybody's retirement system. And this company was the staple of every portfolio in the nation. And the reason for its failure was simply lack of independence for accounting professionals. So much of the blame went to the actual accounting professionals that failed to detect the fraudulent activities of this company. And as a result, we had to go back and really do some soul searching to say, what is it that we did wrong? And why is it that it happened? And how can we change this so that this culture of corruption can go away? So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was passed in 2002. And it requires public companies register with the SEC and their auditor to annually assess and report on the design and effectiveness of internal control over their financial reporting. It also established what we call the PCAOB or the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board that provides independent oversight of all the public accounting firms and their standards or the auditing standards that they uh, publish, they encourage auditors to use a risk-based top-down approach to identifying key controls. Number one, Title I uh, establishes the PCAOB, which pretty much provides all the standards and rules that everybody has to follow uh, if you're practicing public accountancy. It also provides for um, corporate responsibility, which means that public companies are forced to create an audit committee that is independent from the agents of the organization and reports directly to the board. It also uh, states or mandates that all of those financial reports that are created have to be personally guaranteed by the chief XOs, meaning all the chief executive officers, particularly the CFO and the CEO. It also mandates that companies provide enhanced financial disclosures, right, such as if they believe the internal controls they've implemented are effective or not. In addition to that, you have criminal penalties that can be uh, applied for altering documents or defrauding shareholders of publicly traded companies by, by uh, misinforming them or manipulating their, their information. So far, so good. Do you consider the Sarbanes-Oxley Act to be helpful in improving corporate governance? Well, you can take a look at the last 10 years, and there's plenty of research on that. I like to hear your feedback. So what is corporate governance? Corporate governance is a set of processes and policies that manage an organization with some ethics to safeguard the interests of its stakeholders, right? So, so if you look at all the policies and procedures that a company has that are intended to safeguard the interest of the stakeholders, we consider that to be corporate governance. They promote accountability, fairness, and transparency in the organization's relationship with its stakeholders and they align the interests of individuals, corporations, and society in one. And why is that necessary? Well, in publicly traded companies, the owners of the company are not always the ones 
running the company. So there's a very different relationship between the owners and the agents or the managers and executives that are appointed by the boards to actually run the company. And you may own a share of a particular company and you may not necessarily agree with what the company does. And you have the choice to sell that share or not. But you also have the right to exercise that influence on what should be ethical for the corporation to follow. And the agents should be able to have transparency in the relationship with you in, as, as an owner of that company. So internal controls help agents be able to uh, implement processes that will safeguard the assets. It will provide accurate and reliable information of the reports that are generated. They will promote operational efficiency by making sure that everybody follows a standard, creating less variance in view production, if you will. Internal controls also enforce prescribed managerial policies that are implemented for quality purposes, for safety purposes, and other purposes as well. And they also help you comply with applicable laws and regulations. So according to SOX, the establishment and maintenance of internal controls now is a management responsibility and not some external party that just comes up. There are different types of internal controls that can be implemented to help an organization mitigate any type of risk. The first type, just like the name describes it, the preventive controls, pretty much prevents uh, problems from arising before they happen. And they tend to be controls that have authorization procedures. So if you don't want somebody to spend in the wrong materials or amount of materials, quality of materials, then you set up an authorization process in your procurement cycle so that only those individuals that have proper knowledge of what is necessary for production can actually authorize the purchase of such raw materials. You also have detective controls that help you find the problems when they arise. Bank reconciliations and monthly trial balances are a typical example of that because you go through the reconciliation of your bank, making sure that your journal entries actually match what's on the bank. And if there is a problem, any type of discrepancy, then it gets adjusted. Detecting the quality of the products as they come in happens to be another detective control. Why? Because we want to make sure that our inventory is properly evaluated and by, by ensuring that only raw materials that are in good shape and that are adequate for our production are being implemented. Same thing with cells. We want to make sure that all of the cells that are being made are being made at the right price. And so you have to implement detective controls that can analyze that either on a real-time basis or after the fact. Corrective controls, on the other hand, are controls that you implement to fix problems that have been identified. A good example would be, what do you do when something fails? Well, you may switch different vendors. So you may, you may activate a procedure that, that calls for the evaluation of your contracts with different vendors so that you, you do not continue to import or buy raw materials from a vendor that is not providing us with the right quality. Um, being able to recover data from backup files is another example of corrective controls. Again, preventive controls, detective controls, and corrective controls, they all work together so that they can establish internal controls that are going to help you safeguard our assets. Now, in terms of computerized environments, there are two types of controls. General controls pertain to enterprise-wide issues such as control over who has access to the network, who has access to um, the applications that are being developed and maintained, and who has access to changes of any of our programs, right? And what kind of documentation is required for that avoids uh, problems in our production. They have very specific application controls and those application controls are, are very specific to a subsystem or an application so that we can ensure the validity, completeness and accuracy of our transactions. So think of that QuickBooks control when you were trying to do a journal entry and it didn't balance, it would come up with some kind of message that would tell you, hey, this journal entry is not balanced. Please make sure that it does. General controls, on the other hand, will be policies and procedures that you would set uh, so that users can create a password, 
uh, so that users would change the password every three months or so, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there are some commonly used uh, internal control frameworks that really help us uh, get to a place that we want to be in terms of safeguarding our asset. And such frameworks are actually mandated for companies that are publicly traded. Specifically, the SEC requires management to evaluate internal control controls based on a recognized control framework. We love to use the COSO internal control framework because COSO, which was created by the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Tradeway Commission, happened to be done by a collaboration of five different agencies, AAA, AICPA, FEI, IIA, and IMA. Those five different agencies got together with PwC and they created one of the most widely accepted authorities on internal controls. They provided a baseline for evaluating, reporting, and improving internal controls in a way that's very effective. And we're about to see our good friend, the COSO.